You, uh, you feel good? And remarkably, the answer might actually be yes. That's the goal. You might want to live long, but even more importantly, you want to live well. I suppose you're wondering what someone who works in intensive care is doing talking about death and dying. Because we're the high-tech end of medicine. It's almost impossible for people to die in intensive care. We've got machines that can support almost every organ apart from perhaps the liver and the brain. So why am I interested in death and dying? Because over the last 25 years, things have changed rapidly. I used to treat younger people with a single disease, and that's what hospitals and medicines built around. But now they're much older, and they've got multiple conditions. And multiple conditions add up to more than the sum of the parts. But we haven't adapted to that. And so most of my patients now are over the age of 70. Many of them are in their 80s and some in their 90s, and we've had two that have been over 100 years of age. And there's hardly a day goes by when one of my colleagues doesn't say, please don't ever let this happen to me. So what are we doing? How does this occur? And a lot of it's got to do with an ageing and death-defying society meeting an ageing and death-denying medical system. So let's start with the not-so-happy stuff. And this is about ageing. And there's this wonderful word, apoptosis, which means at conception, embedded in your genes are when each of your tissues and cells are going to die. So if you live really, really well, have a really good diet, really good exercise, then you'll reach your apoptotic potential. Maybe it's 90, maybe 95. But you won't live past it. It's all built in there. From the, from the moment you're born, well, the, from the moment that you're conceived, it's built in there. So all the organelles, tissues, organs, they're programmed to slowly die, and that sort of makes a sense. We're designed evolutionarily to be born, to breed, and to die. And you notice that men peak at about 25, women a bit older. And you'll see this with sport. Gymnasts, swimmers, hardly anyone over the age of 22. Footballers, about 30. Now, there are exceptions such as Roger Federer, for example, who lives past these limits, but it's a downhill run for men and women after about the mid-20s or 30s. That's just part of life, part of living. So the clinical manifestations are you get older, you develop chronic health conditions. These are found mainly in older people, almost invariably. And you become more disabled with the activities of daily living. You find it harder to get up from the chair, harder to get out of the car, and you become frailer. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about frailer later. So we've all been allocated, allocated a certain definite number of days. Ageing, I won't go into this in one of the books I've written. If you want more details about ageing, it's all there in all of its horrors. Everything deteriorates. Your sense of smell, sense of taste, the graying of the hair, the wrinkling of the skin, 30% loss of function in the heart, 50% loss of function in the liver, etc., etc. And that's a bit unfortunate, but it's real. This is a picture I took in a chemist shop. And 20 years ago, there was hardly a section devoted to older people. And now you see this increasing section in chemist shops of incontinence pads and all sorts of things to help you get up and help you get down and help you to get out. So it's progressive and it's inevitable. It can be tweaked. So we heard from a speaker this morning that there are positive ageing and negative ageing, and of course there is. But there's also a realism that needs to be attached to ageing. You can't get away from it. You can take diets and exercise, and all those things are fantastic, and you will feel much the better for it. However, you will still age. Zeus granted Thithonus his wish 
of immortality. So he could live forever, but he cunningly withheld eternal youth. And you can't imagine a worse fate than this, that your body just gets older and older and you fall apart until you become this decrepit shell. And so we're hearing lately about, in fact, I heard it from one of the Australian politicians, oh, very soon we'll all be living to 150. Well, of course, more of us are living longer, and that's due to public health mainly, but also lifestyle choices. But you won't live past your apoptotic potential. And while you hear lovely anecdotes about the 90-year-old and the 100-year-old who can still do marathon swimming and things like that, most people age in, in a way where they can do less and less things and that's fine, and most people adapt to it pretty well. Now, I didn't know how to fit this slide in, but I thought I had to fit it in. It's got nothing to do with the talk. <laughs> but I just couldn't resist it, because as I, as I was invited to this talk on happiness, then I thought, no, I need to talk about when I lived in Denmark for a little while. Any Danes in the audience? Oh. Okay, okay, well you'll, have, well, you'll have to forgive my pronunciation. But there's a Danish word, luka, and so if you're, if you're sending best wishes of happiness to people, it's to luka. And there's another love, but, but that's also, you're giving your happiness to others. And there's another word, word called huga, hugelit, and that's cosy, it's a sense of warm being. But it's more than that and perhaps I could get the Danish people to elaborate on that, but, but the people I live with in, Dan in Denmark said that Huga is also about the comfort or the enjoyment or the happiness one gets from looking at other people in our society who aren't suffering. And I really like that concept. That it's not just all personal, am I happy? Have I got well-being? It's also the joy one gets from knowing that other people are happy. So, for example, where you don't see so much homelessness, where you don't see advertisements on our television making out that equipping children with clothes and textbooks is a charity rather than something that we do as a society. And there's another Danish word called skat, which means on the one hand, it's a term of endearment, my darling or whatever, but scat is also taxes. The English word taxes is hard and crippling, whereas, whereas the Danish word scat, it's, it's the money you pay to get the sense of happiness and enjoyment from being in a society where you don't see so much suffering. So I better get back onto the talk, but I couldn't resist that. Are hospitals good places to die? <laughs> um, they're not good places to die. I've got to be honest with you, we're not set up for managing people at the end of life. For, for, for example, it's very difficult for the clever cardiologist who's focusing on one organ, and remember in hospitals we're divided into organs, cardiology, neurology, respiratory medicine, nephrology, etc. It's They spend their life learning all about that organ and they're very good at it. But the population of patients now are older with multi-organ progressive problems. And so it's very difficult for my colleagues to recognise people who are dying. And even if they do recognise them, the, the management is often inappropriate resulting in a lot of suffering and pain. Do doctors know how to diagnose dying and understand the limits of modern medicine? No. This is a large study that we did that said that ineffective and inappropriate futile interventions were up to one-third of all people in hospital. So we're doing things to them because we can do things to them. And this is a high-tech area of medicine of course, and we, we can do a lot of good things, but we're doing a lot of these good things to people who are naturally and normally at the end of life. 
And so we're delaying the diagnosis of dying until the very end. So we set up an emergency system in the hospital, which is like a cardiac arrest team, but trying to get there earlier. And one third of all of those calls are for people who are naturally and normally dying within hours or days. They're just not recognised as such. Pneumonia used to be called the old person's friend. If you want to die a really nice death, pneumonia is the way to go. It's painless. You, 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 know, you gradually drift away and, and uh, it's very peaceful and painless. Nelson Mandela died of old age and frailty. But he was treated on life support machines and ventilators and all sorts of things. And of all the people in the world who had the courage to accept the fact that he was dying, he certainly was one of them. Bob Hawke died of old age. He didn't have cancer. He didn't have a single disease. He died of old age. So modern medicine doesn't work for old people. This is what happens to Australians in the last year of their life. About eight hospital admissions, two ED visits, and a 60% or 70% chance of dying. This is a picture of myself in the 50s, just before my grandfather, my mother's father, pictured there. This is a street photograph, because many people didn't have cameras, and so in the streets of Sydney there were street photographs who took your name and address, and then you went and collected the picture. And this is the picture of myself with my grandfather, who died naturally and normally at home a year after this was taken. Everyone's grandfather died naturally and normally at home. What the GP had in their bag was about the same as what we had in acute hospitals. Then there was this explosion of technology. And the explosion of technology, you imagine if someone in this room became ill or fainted or fell over. The first reaction, and quite normal reaction, call an ambulance. So the ambulance, quite naturally and normally, takes you to the emergency department. The emergency department is geared for rapid assessment and either admission or sending you home. So many sick people are admitted to hospital. Many older people are admitted to hospital. And that's because many older Australians don't have a formal end-of-life statement. They come into the hospital ward and then they're admitted to my intensive care unit where one of my colleagues rings up and says, Ken, I've got a 90-year-old person down here. Um, I've talked to the relatives, and they said they want everything done. And that's an awful thing to do. And so the patient comes up with expectations, and that's because the doctor hasn't been honest enough to say, look, you're dying, there's nothing more that can be done. So they're offering... Would you like your father, mother to die, or would you like them to go up to the intensive care? That's the only hope left. Once you put it like that, once you make relatives feel guilty, then most of them say, oh yes, we, we should try everything. So this is where I work. $5,000 per patient per day, $1.5 million per bed per year. And so we drain an awful lot of society's budget. So imagine what you could do if you empower old people with a choice to be treated elsewhere. Imagine what you could do with $5,000 every day. You would get Rolls-Royce care, best hotel in Sydney, 24-hour nursing care, whatever. And it's very hard to die in a hospital or ICU these days. We can keep people alive for a long, long time. Unfortunately, then we discharge them from hospital and they die very soon after. So the elderly patients experience repeated hospitalisation. They're not recognised as increasingly frail and we don't include them in discussions. We don't empower them. If you have a heart attack or a single problem, it's easy. Heart attack, cardiologist, stroke, neurologist, etc. But what happens if you're dying, just naturally and normally dying? And there are many, many people who go into hospital to naturally and normally die. 
Who would manage that? Well, you come in under a specialist surgeon or physician, and, and they're not very good at this. Palliative care operate around the edges, and it's only really towards the end of life that we call them. Geriatricians, I guess that there's, there's a much greater role for geriatricians, um, and, and many of them are very good, but some of them still focus on how do I make this old person better, even though this, and without, without having complex and detailed talks with the patient. 70% of Australians want to die at home, 70% will die in acute hospitals. The good news is there is such a thing as a good death. And this, the, the more I work in this area, the more I believe this should be determined by people themselves. The, this is some of the research that we're doing. It's a tool to try and predict in the elderly people how long they've got to live. And it's called the crystal tool, but it's been adapted and changed. And we did work in in 14 hospitals in five countries, over 3,000 patients, a very big, detailed study. And of all the things that are the predictors, age, no-brainer. Frailty and disseminated cancer. Disseminated cancer, again, no-brainer. But I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about frailty because that's becoming extremely important. This is the scale we use. There are over 50 scales for frailty. We use this one because it's very simple. It's on a scale of one to nine, and you can see one's quite normal, and then you're gradually getting older, and you've got walking frames and wheelchairs and sitting in a bed and then sitting in a chair and whatever. So that's the frailty score that we use. It is very, very easy. There's a little bit of a text associated with each of those pictures. But this is a very powerful tool. It can predict how long you'll be in hospital, chances of living while you're in hospital, chances of your quality of life when you leave hospital, and chances of you living after you leave hospital. It's a very powerful tool. Not 100% accurate, but then nothing is 100% accurate in medicine. So there's uncertainty, of course. So th this is what we do with all of this information now. And we've had to learn about it over the, over the last five years. And we've added things to it. But instead of just starting out with advanced care directives, we find out what sort of person they are. Now, I know this sounds obvious, but it wasn't obvious to us. So we find out what, what's important in this person's life, what sort of person they are, their attitudes and beliefs, because the attitudes and beliefs will drive their choices about what sort of treatment they want or what sort of treatment they don't want. We then use that to have an honest and empathetic discussion using the data we've got collected from tools such as the frailty tool. So we're, we're honest about this, but we're also empathetic. And then we empower people to make their own choices. So we lead into this. I don't know how many of you fill out advanced care directives, but usually they're just tick box things. And I don't think that's a very good idea. I think it's much better to explore what sort of person that you're dealing with and have them make these choices, because the choices are difficult, and there's a lot of I-dotting and T-crossing and ifs and buts. And then we follow it up, because your, your priorities in life change. So they might say, you know, under these circumstances, I don't want to be treated, or I want a little bit of treatment. But then as you get older, you might be very happy with your life, and so you, and so you can change this advanced care directive. It's called an advanced care directive, but it's much bigger than that. It's really stating your choices about health while you're living, as well as what happens when you, when you aren't able to make these choices yourself. So instead of saying, I never want to be ventilated, I never want dialysis, I never want hospital, I never want to be in ICU, we turn that around and we say, if I was demented, bed-bound, 
incurable pain, incontinent, or whatever, 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 I would like no treatment at all. Or I would like some treatment in my home. Or I would still like to be taken to hospital by ambulance. So it's starting from the attitudes and beliefs and stating conditions which people would find unacceptable. So here are some. This is a nice study from, uh, from a very highly prestigious journal, JAMA. And these are the people who would, who've stated that these conditions in their mind would be worse than death. Doubly incontinent, being on a ventilator, can't get out of bed, demented, relying on, f on feeding tubes, full-time care, living in a nursing home, continue to live at home in a wheelchair. So, the, so, so it's turning things around. Now this might change. And of course we need to be constantly upgrading that. So, happiness is not about false hope and fake news. It's not about prolonging life when life is fading rapidly. And it's not about having society telling you how to manage your own aging and dying. It's about empowering you to make these choices. So just finally, you're in control of your own end and that has to become more important. It's very rare at the moment. I know that sounds strange, but it's not common that we empower you to make these choices. Where you have no pain and suffering, suffering you have your dignity, and the role of medicine in society is to support you in what your wishes are. And the more we deal with this area, the more we know that it's a social construct. Dying is more of a social construct. And we've heard all about loneliness and other things today. These are, I believe, more important than the medical constructs. So it can be satisfying to the people and carers. I love breaking the rules. They've got these mindless rules in hospitals which come from God knows where about you can only visit between 11 and 1 and you're not allowed to have pets or you're not allowed to make a noise or you're not allowed to sing songs or whatever. We love breaking those rules. It's about listening carefully to people, alleviating guilt and living with silences. And this takes, I believe, a lot of training and many of us are not good at that. I, th I think doctors need a whole new education process, ensuring that everyone has their dignity and, of course, addressing pain and suffering. Healthy ageing, it's a great goal, but not at the expense of giving people false hope and dishonesty. I think I... I think I'll just leave that one because I've made my message pretty clear. It's about empowering you to make these choices. It wasn't that long ago, and perhaps some people in the audience will remember the fact that in, even up until the 1970s, birthing, you, you had no options. You went into hospital, you were strung up in lithotomy, baby delivered, hardly any pain relief, father not allowed to be there, baby taken away. And then it didn't take long. Within a, deco a decade or so, society and people had control over their own birthing process. And I believe that it's time that society and people had control over their own dying process. Thank you very much.